Now, uh, Lynn, this question comes from, uh, from an American. She's a, a former cabinet member of a previous administration, and she is uh, currently an outside advisor, uh, although her days may be numbered, uh, to this administration. And she says, uh, Lynn, earlier this week, uh, as you know, extensive talks took place in Washington between the United States and China, uh, and I had the opportunity to participate in those. Understandably, as America's largest creditor, the Chinese asked us some very direct questions. Now, I should mention that those questions were posed in what was probably a less than ideal climate for the Chinese. Uh, President Obama had opened the talks with an unnecessary and I thought arrogant slap at China's human rights record. Uh, also, there was widespread criticism in the American and British press and elsewhere, complaining that the Chinese were spending far too much money on infrastructure and not nearly enough money on building consumer markets in their own country. Um, but even with that backdrop, I was surprised and frankly disturbed by the extent of what seemed to be China's acceptance of assurances delivered by Tim Geithner and Mr. Orsag on the, uh, on the recovery uh, that is currently going on in the United States. She asks, what is your assessment of this? Do the Chinese understand the unsustainability of this policy, or have, is it possible that they have bought into an ideology that worships this mountain of worthless paper? Well, you know, there's a trend in Chinese culture, which we have, some of us are more or less acquainted with. I would say perfectly acquainted with, but as in other cultures. We in the United States, under liberal influences, don't know how to think anymore. In, and, and in China, the great philosophical currents that we know of in China think in the opposite way to what typical Americans think today. The typical American today thinks from today on and says tomorrow is tomorrow. Or if they really far think, far sighted, they think two days ahead. Or next week's paycheck, or whatever, or something like that. It's by increments. Because they are, the Americans are conditioned to be behaviorists. And behaviorists are degenerates, as you see in the case of our president, who is a behaviorist. He's a degenerate because he's a behaviorist, which makes him tend to, and if you read Adam Smith, particularly the relevant section of the third chapter of his book, relevant book, not the uh, 1879 book, uh, 1859 book, then you recognize exactly what the problem is. And you recognize that the degeneracy, the moral, personal moral degeneracy of his key advisors, that is, Orzag, Summers, the whole behaviorist crowd, is exactly that. They are essentially fascists in intent. They think like Hitler's people do. They have a different flavor. They speak it in a different language. It's essentially British fascism, that of Adam Smith. And therefore, they, since you don't believe, as he emphasizes, as Adam Smith does, they don't believe that there's a knowledgeable accountability for the future in human behavior, but you're only supposed to react in the short term. The Americans, to the extent that they're brainwashed in universities and other places where this behaviorist outlook, this redu radically reductionist outlook takes over, that they're not capable of competent thinking. Or the only, they can only think competently by scaring the pants off them, right? which you take away all their toys and tell them, take, are taking away all your toys? Now what are you going to play with? And unfortunately, they will tell you what they're going to do. But, <laughs> But in the case of a real culture, like a culture of China among serious thinkers in Chinese culture, and I think the Chinese government tries to adopt as much as possible the serious thinkers of its, uh, its history, its own cultural outlook, you think about the future. The Chinese keep talking about centuries to come. 
at least the great thinkers do, the important ones who die, which are, are with whom I'm impressed. Uh, and therefore, they will tend to think of, well, here's the United States. We've got this lump up there. It's called a president. And uh, we're trying to get along with him. Uh, we're trying to get something workable here, because we realize there's something that has to be a relationship between the two states. Now, the immediate question here is the money that the United States owes to China. And that China's concern is, is that money that is owed to China by the United States going to be paid? Now, it, since China has just gone through a collapse of its international market, export market, this is extremely important. So China does not want to get into a fight over this issue, and I wouldn't encourage China to get into a fight over this issue. I would encourage China to say, look, you want to talk to me as American? Count on me. Because I know my Americans. I know them better than they know themselves. And under certain conditions, they're going to revolt, and they're going to agree with you. That is, the, the, the Americans are going to agree with the Chinese, and the Chinese are going to agree with the Americans, because they're going to agree on a, the importance of a people-to-people -people cooperation. Look, imagine China. It's a big nation. It has a relationship to Russia. It has a relationship to India. They don't really agree. I mean, Russia and China can cooperate, but there's not really any stable, natural agreement there. India? India and China are constantly negotiating, trying to minimize any conflict for mutual interest. Russia and China try to cooperate. India and China try to cooperate. But they're Asian countries, and here they are in proximity to each other with these, all these kinds of conflict or conflict-related issues among them, as about with other nations, relations to smaller nations among them. And then they look across the water to the United States. And what China needs, as Russia needs, and as India needs, they need the United States. Because the United States existentially is not a neighbor, and therefore, if you have a, all these neighbors are coming together with the United States, then you have the basis for a global agreement. And you have a basis for defining a common interest which is higher than any individual conflict relation among the nations considered pairwise. So the Chinese who think will recognize the importance of the United States as eliminating one of the major problems and the major problems of the region in Asia is the relations among Russia, China, and India. It was pairwise. Therefore, if the United States is a factor at a time that Western and Central Europe is absolutely useless for this purpose, this is the natural interest of China and the natural interest of the United States. That debt of the United States to China is the pivot of this agreement, because it depends upon that agreement. And thus, that agreement among Russia, China, and India, and the United States, is crucial. It must occur. If you want a future history of this planet, that must occur. And that's the way you have to look at it. Forget the other kinds of questions. Now, on the, on, on the economic side of this thing, what we require, and I think I would, if were I president right now, or were I, did I have a president who I thought was sane, I would suggest, again, as I said today earlier, the space program. The first thing we want to put on the agenda, as the, the spice, the flavoring, on the, on the business is the question of the space program. I want a good agreement among Russia, China, India, and the United States on Mars. No, not, not on territory on Mars. I don't think. <laughs> There's some people I would like to send as an advance guard to Mars right now. I, I think, 
I think our president ought to take a diplomatic trip to Mars and see if he can survive, <laughs> see if he can survive it. But no, I, you see, because again, we're talking about the best thinking in China, what we have from China. China's always talking about look ahead to the future, policy, Chinese government, always that. I like to look at the future, too. We have people in Russia who like to look at the future, in the, particularly in this Academy of Sciences and things like that. Some people in India like to think of the future, like Tilak did, for example, Bal Kasha Tilak. Uh, so we want to talk, have an agreement on the future. What's the future? The future is what are we going to do about Mars? Not what are we going to, how are we going to carve it up, but how are we going to get human beings there and back safely alive? Now that's going to take a science driver program, which is easy to conceive of because we already had that kind of thing in the space program earlier. So revive that. Refine it. Now let's come to an agreement on what our objectives are. You can't define all the terms, but the objectives. And we're going to have a committee which will constantly look at the list of the questions. We're going to look at the existing space program. We're going to think about how we have to overhaul it for this purpose. And we're going to back and go talk to human beings for well, the first 50 years, two generations today. Huh? People living today, people who are young adults today, will still be living 50 years from now. We're going to talk about that. What are we going to do between now and 50 years from now? What direction are we going to take? What's our technology? What do we need to do? And we're going to base our entire economic development on looking at everything from that standpoint. We say, we are in the generation which is going to go to Mars. We're going to solve the problem of relativistic travel by human beings in well-controlled magnetic fields and gravitational fields. We're going to travel that distant ascent and descent to Mars. We're going to develop a, advanced colonies there. And this is going to be mankind by going into a one gravity relationship and travel of human beings between two points on the solar system. We're going to change the definition of the meaning of the term mankind. We now think of mankind as earthlings. People stuck on earth, can't get out of the place. <laughs> you can go on a honeymoon, but they, you can't get to, to Mars. <laughs> I don't know if they have any honeymoons anymore. I haven't checked recently. <laughs> I think they have more informal relations <clears throat> these days. But in any case, you're going to, you're going to define a, a relationship for, uh, with yourself to the future and for your children to the future. So we have to think the development that has to occur in China and in Russia, for example, in Siberia particularly, we're talking about really a 50-year cycle of primary development just to get the thing going. China's development is 50 years, minimum. So when we're talking about a space program, we're talking about the kind of technological progress, the techn environmental technological progress, which is going to carry us to that destination. We have to change the thinking. Get out of this thing about arguing about what's going next door, who's cooking what meal tomorrow morning, and get into something a little bit more serious. And when we agree on the long term, we are then talking about what? We're talking about our grandchildren, our children and our grandchildren. We're talking about our relationship, our future relationship of our children and our grandchildren among nations based on a common mission with a common destiny. Then, then come back to the negotiating table. Then come back to all your economic agreements. Come back, now look at them with this inspiration in mind. And that's the way we've got to approach this. No, we got all these idiots. I know we're fussy with these idiots in, in Washington, the idiots of the Obama administration. We know it's doomed. Look, it's finished. Obama's not going to be around much longer. He's garbage. He's waste material. He's, when a man says he has the policies of Adolf Hitler on health care, as Obama has made it absolutely clear, this man is not fit for any public office. And he, his existence is, a, is really a blot on the escutcheon of any nation. 
And he's an embarrassment. And think of him as Mr. Embarrassment, not Mr. President. <laughs> and then you've got it about right. So in this case, let's not get too upset about Obama. He's already upsetting enough. Let's think about his retirement. And let's concentrate on what we are going to do very subversively on, the, on behalf of humanity against his shenanigans. <laughs>